I had been noticing all of these pottery references in the Bible, and I really wanted a book like that that would kind of unpack these verses from a background in ceramics. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't find what I was looking for. So at the time, um, I just felt the Holy Spirit calling me to work on that. And so in 2019, I really started the book, but it didn't become what it is. It didn't, um, I had to rewrite it at a point, and it didn't really become what it was until 2023. <laughs> Welcome to Story Power, a bi-monthly podcast where my guests and I chat about stories and creativity in all different styles and formats. My name is Lucinda Sage Midgordon, and my goal is to promote what Dale Carnegie stated in his famous book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. He said, instead of condemning people, let's try to understand them. Let's try to figure out why they do what they do. That's a lot more profitable and intriguing than criticism, and it breeds sympathy, tolerance, and kindness. To know all is to forgive all. It's my firm belief that the goal of most creative people is to try to understand themselves and others. That's what makes artwork of all kinds so compelling. But more than that, the personal stories of my guests promote understanding as well. Roger C. Shank, a cognitive scientist, said, Human beings are not ideally set up to understand logic. They are ideally set up to understand stories. It's my hope that story power will help us understand each other better by sharing the stories of my guests. Hello to Story Power. This is episode 107, and I'm talking to Morgan McCarver. And Morgan is, has a lot to tell us about her life story. But one thing that I connected with her was she's a ceramicist, a potter, and my husband loves to do pottery. So welcome to the show, Morgan. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So I want to hear your story about uh, your how you got into ceramics, and um, and also your health challenges that might have affected that, and then how all of that led to writing a book. Of course. Well, it really started kind of back in middle school or even earlier elementary school. Actually, mm -hmm. I was diagnosed with scoliosis when I was in fifth grade. And for those who don't know, that's a genetic disorder where basically when I hit that final growth spurt, my spine did not grow straight like it was supposed to. It grew from side to side. So I had an S curve on my back. I had three different curves and they were rotating by degrees. Um, so my my spine was getting worse. It was twisting and it was um, compressing. And so that at the time wasn't very painful, but um, the doctors saw that over time it would be more painful. My quality of life would not um, be what it could be because my spine was only getting worse. Yeah. And so after wearing a back brace for three years, I ended up having surgery um, to straighten out my spine. And so I have two titanium rods and 18 screws in my back holding my spine straight still to this day. And ultimately, that's what got me into pottery. I know it doesn't sound like it, but <laughs> I was a dancer at the time. And so I couldn't dance during a year-long recovery process. That just was not going to mm. um, be good for me in my recovery. And so that's really when um, my mom just signed me up for a pottery class. I was 14 at the time. And I fell in love with it, the flexibility of the clay, the personal relationship you mm -hmm. have touching that medium. Um, and as they say, the rest is history. That's what I ended up going to school for. Um, that's my business now. And that ultimately led to the book. Oh, that is, oh man. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so the titanium braces, I would think that would make it hard to dance because, you know, sometimes dancers have to be really flexible. What did that, was that part of it? Not being able to, um, 
Well, actually, I the way that my doctors did it was it was a plastic back brace that I only had to wear at night or when I was uh-huh. in the house. So I thankfully I didn't have to wear it in public. Uh-huh. Um, but it was not very comfortable. It was pretty painful because it was trying to push my spine the opposite way it wanted to go, of oh. course. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Geez. So and unfortunately, it didn't do what it was supposed to. So, oh, yeah, um, that's what led to the surgery. It didn't work. Oh man, that's, but at least now, although it must be really hard to go through, uh, like when you're going to, uh, TSA at the airport, cause you've got to, <laughs> tell, you, know, you have to tell them, Oh, I have titanium in my back. <laughs> right. Yeah. Sometimes I do get buzzed, but not as often as you would think. So, you know, oh. you never know. <laughs> oh, my, when my mom was alive, she had a, a, a titanium hip and it always, it always set it off. Oh no. So, yeah. <laughs> so she had to tell him, Oh, I have a titanium hip. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. So now what kind of ceramics do you do? Do you, uh, th- do you throw, do you hand build? Do you, uh, what do you just, what do you do? Do you pour it into a mold? Yeah, all of the above. You're great with that ceramics vocabulary. But um, yes, you're right. I do a little bit of everything. So I do throw on the wheel sometimes. Um, because of my back, I kind of have to schedule when in the month I'm going to throw and I pretty much limit myself to one time a month. Um, but I also hand build. And then because of my back, I use a lot of molds in my work, like you were talking about slip casting. Um, so I make my own plaster molds and then I pour the liquid clay into those to get the casts mm-hmm. the same shape every time. Um, and so that's where my true passion is my love. Um, so I work with porcelain mostly and, um, a lot of hexagons in my work because they are like a circle, but they have those angles and lines. And so Mm -hmm, it's that mm -hmm. battle of the human desire to control the organic, just like, um, my back brace or just like Victorian corsetry or, Uh, um, just like landscaping. There's that human desire to control the organic that I think is so fascinating. Mm-hmm. Now, when you're doing, cause I don't think people who, who don't do pottery know I have tried it. So I know <laughs> when the reason you have to be careful about the, uh, the wheel throwing is because when you're pulling on the clay, it's not, it, if you're watching it, it looks so easy, but it's <laughs> not, you have to use a lot of muscle to, to do that. Yeah. Yeah, you do. Um, it takes, it takes an equal balance of, you know, dexterity, knowing that hand-eye coordination combined with the muscle being able to force that clay to the center of the wheel. And then also leverage, um, which is what I use a lot in my work, Mm -hmm. you know, using um, tools to help me out or using leverage against the wheel or against my leg um, Mm -hmm. to really push into the clay. So I'm not constantly straining my back and just working as ergonomically as possible. Yeah. And you have to have strong arms too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When my husband was doing it, it was like, oh, nice arm <laughs> muscles. <laughs> but yeah. Um. So, what kind of firing glaze? What kind of firing do you do? And what kind of glazes do you use? Yeah, I mainly do electric firings. Um. So I fire in an Olympic kiln that um actually someone was giving away for free. And so I pretty much gutted the kiln and uh, rebuilt it, which was a lot of fun to rewire it and all that stuff. Uh Um, But I fire electric. So it's an oxidation firing and I mainly use clear glazes. um, And it's actually a glaze that I kind of reformulated to match my clay um, because during the pandemic, there was a shortage of a lot of different supplies. And so glaze recipes were changing and the manufacturers weren't always telling us. And my porcelain can be kind of finicky, with the glaze fit combination. Mm -hmm. And I realized there were a lot of problems with my finished pieces and I was losing a good bit of product. So at that point I decided that I would just take control into my own hands and make my own glaze. So I knew exactly how it was Mm -hmm. going to react with my pottery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's when my husband ran the pottery studio at the city, that's what they did. They bought the chemicals and made their own glazes, but he was really into Raku. So Okay. Uh, that is fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, they still had to, you know, they had to, to fire it, to make it hard so that they could do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I forgot what that's called all of a sudden. Um, yeah. But so when you do clear glazes though, 
do you like decorate it underneath the glaze or on top of the glaze? I, yeah, I actually decorate underneath. Um, ah, so before uh -huh. it goes into the bisque firing, I'll actually, um, I have four different wildflower designs that I've hand drawn. Oh, and yeah. then I um, had silk screens made of those. So I screen print my flowers on as transfers. And that way I have four different collections oh. of wildflowers that I incorporate into my work. Oh, so yeah, the surface design is really uh, my, my real uh, expression, I guess, is a good way to put it. I can kind yes. of overlay patterns and really make that my own. Oh, wow. That's so exciting. Yeah. It's good to talk to somebody who does pottery. Yeah. <laughs> so now tell about how did the pottery, uh, doing the pottery, how did that lead to the book? And tell I, about your book. Of course. Well, I was, I went to school for pottery, like I mentioned. So I was at Anderson University in South Carolina, and I was about to lose this pottery community that I had had for four years because that's what happens when you graduate, you know. Yeah. And um, I was just looking for a book that would um, talk to me about I had been noticing all of these pottery references in the Bible. And I really wanted a book like that that would kind of unpack these verses from a background in ceramics. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't find what I was looking for. So at the time. Um, I just felt the Holy Spirit calling me to work on that. And so in 2019, I really started the book, but it didn't become what it is. It didn't, um, I had to rewrite it at a point and it didn't really become what it was until 2023, January. Mm -hmm. And um, so now that's, that is the finished product. God, the artist is really unpacking um, all of these verses in the Bible from my Christian and ceramics backgrounds and really yes. seeing the um, symbolism throughout that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, because uh, I love the the analogy or the symbolism of God molding us like clay. Yeah. I like that, I like that mm -hmm. a lot. Now, I, I have a question about that, though, about the... Now, I can't think what I was going to ask you. Oh, well, it doesn't <laughs> matter, I guess. <laughs> because you were talking about your book, and then I thought it flashed you through my mind, but I was listening, so I forgot. What <laughs> Sometimes yeah, that happens to the best of us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I like to listen to the person talking and then ask the question. So, <laughs> so where do you sell your book? Um, it is traditionally published with Morgan James Publishing. So oh. thankfully, it's sold wherever books are sold, essentially. So huh. online, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, Walmart, all those good places. Started. Now, where is your store? So I am in For several different galleries. Yeah, I'm in several different galleries between um, the Carolinas and Tennessee. I live in uh -huh. North Carolina now. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. so um, I have some some stuff in various places around different shops and things. And then Tennessee, I'm at the Great Smoky Mountain Heritage Center, which is really fun. Uh -huh. I'm at the Asheville Art Museum gift shop. So it's really fun to drive around to these towns and restock because I don't always, you know, go visit like right. Rivard, North Carolina on a daily basis or, right. or anything like that. So it's a lot of fun. And you, and I remember now I was reading your biography and it had that you had two, uh, single person shows is that correct shows just of your yes. work yeah solo exhibitions yes um those cool. those are uh so much work and so worth it to just be able to transform a space um with all of my own work and my pottery and really be able to spread a message um with my work and to just have all these amazing pictures of my work displayed in some really beautiful mm -hmm. spots it's a lot of fun mm -hmm. Yeah, I have never uh, exhibited my own work, but I used to work at a place called Sophia Center where my husband was teaching pottery too. And uh, they would have art shows and I would be kind of one of the people that was organizing the different potters and artwork. And so it takes, you know, it's not you can't just say, oh, I'm going to just throw this stuff on tables. No, it's not like that. So did you have to organize your own? Sorry, you cut out for a second. What did oh, you say? Did you have to organize your own? Did you get to organize your own work or did somebody else do that for you? Um, I got to organize my own, which made it so much more fun because I got to decide what pieces go beside each other and yes. how to set them up and which pieces to elevate on risers and um, kind yes. of showcase my work that way. 
Yeah, and I hope they had special lighting and things like that. To- yes, they did. Lighting definitely helps with the porcelain because um, porcelain clay is a little bit translucent. So it's really nice when the light hits it just right to be able to kind of watch it glow in a sense. Yes, yes. My husband usually does stonework, but uh, stoneware, but he or, or, um, what's the red clay, but he has done some porcelain and it's okay. Yeah. Porcelain is beautiful. I love it. Yeah. We have lots of kind of raccoon things. Does he do? Yeah. Um, yeah. He uses the stoneware for the raccoon, I think. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but when he was in college, he did do some porcelain work. So (laughs) now, so, so is that your sole income or do you have to have a job on the side? Like a lot of artists. Yeah. Originally I, um, I moved up to Asheville, North Carolina. It's a really big art community. And so I moved up here to work for a potter as a studio assistant. And I did that for about a year and a half. And I learned so much. It was such a great experience, Mm -hmm. just learning how to run a studio and how to display your work appropriately and Mm -hmm. how to apply to shows and all of that. Um, Mm -hmm. So now I do have, you're right. I do have a desk job. And then I kind of conserve my energy for the evenings when I can go into the studio and make, uh, make my own stuff. Mm -hmm. So desk job. Yeah. Uh, One of the writers that I talked to said, yeah, I, my side job is working at Walmart, but my real job is writing. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. And it sounds sort of like that's with, that's the way you feel about your artwork. It's your real job, but the, uh, working in the office is your side job, your side gig. I I like that. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. Really. I thought so too. And so, uh, I have to, I had to think of it that way, except that now I'm retired. I can, you know, I can do my own work and take as much time during the day as I want. So that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. So are you close to family in Asheville? No, actually, well, I'm about an hour away. I'm from upstate South Carolina. And so that's where the majority of my family is. Oh, so that's not Um, so far. Yeah, it's not far. Um, But I did move up here, not really knowing anyone but the potter I was going to work for. I had met her twice. And so that was um, a huge learning curve for me to move to a different state, a different town. And, um, you know, just figure out life on my own, so to speak. Yeah. And make friends. Exactly. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, really. Um, So do you want to say anything else about your art, your artwork or your book. I want to hear more about your book. Okay. Um, basically I start by opening up part one. It talks about how I believe we're all creative. And I think that's something that people don't always realize that, especially with social media, people Mm -hmm. think that creativity is only for, you know, a select few, or you have to be born with a talent. And I think that's because they're seeing themselves as not good as, you know, not as good as these people that are posting. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're not, but that doesn't mean that they aren't creative, you know, and everybody has their own creativity, their own special touch, Mm -hmm. um, their own signature, so to speak. We don't, um, do everything the same way because for one, our hands are different sizes. We have different skill levels. We have different ideas in our brains. And I think that's so powerful to remember that we all are creative. Mm -hmm. And I believe that because I believe that God is creative and he made us in his image. And so by default, we are creative human beings. And I think that's so beautiful um, to just remind ourselves that we have this imagination inside of us that we can use um, in our daily lives And so from there, I really um, go through the steps of pottery. And so I say you don't have to be a potter to read this book that I really unpack that. Mm -hmm. And um, we just start at the very beginning of what is clay? How do you um, get clay? Where does Mm -hmm. clay come from? And um, you can process clay right out of the ground, especially here in North Carolina, that red dirt. Mm -hmm. Um, is actually clay. And so I've processed some of that. And that's a lot of, it's a lot of work. um, But it's Mm -hmm. very rewarding to process clay directly from the ground. Mm -hmm. And um, just how there are so many different types of clay, like we were talking about earlier, there's stoneware, earthenware, porcelain, and different types of clay do different things. And that's same with humanity again, you know, it doesn't mean that we're not as good as other people, both things are needed. 
And um, so there's so much symbolism all throughout this that just really I unpack as I go through each chapter. We go through throwing on the pottery wheel um, to firing pieces in the kiln to glazing pieces and then taking them out of the kiln. And um, it's just so amazing to see all of that beautiful symbolism that God's just wrapped up into all of that. Oh, yes. When I was teaching, I my background's in theater, and I, for a while I had to teach English uh, because I went mm. to a school that didn't have a theater program. I went from a school that had a theater program and then I went to another one. But I used to tell my students, you know, everybody's creative and maybe uh, maybe you're creative in a way that you don't think of as creative, but maybe you're a good cook or a good gardener or a really good friend or, you know, and I would just list all these things. And it, sometimes it was really interesting to see my students' eyes get kind of big, like, oh, I never thought of it like that before. Because, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you're really good at organizing um, and you work in an office and you can reorganize the way the workflow or something. Maybe that's how you're creative. So that was that was fun to get yeah. them to think about different ways to be creative. Yeah. Right. That's a great point because creativity is really making something that didn't exist before. So you're right. Bringing organization into, you know, a pile of messy laundry. That's being creative <laughs> that's in right. so many ways. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And I didn't even discover pottery until I had the traumatic back surgery. You know, mm -hmm. there's so many things that maybe you just haven't tried yet. If you're feeling that you aren't creative, um, try something new. You never know. Right. Something that sounds fun. Yeah. yeah, because and my students used to, and even my college students, um, you know, oh, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. And I said, I was 54 when I figured out what I wanted to be when I grew up. And so don't worry about it. This is your time to explore. Ex you right. know, exploring is always, always good. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so I remembered what it was I was going to say, you know, one of the things um, my niece is studying archaeology. And one of the things that survives is pottery. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things that they can, when they do their digs, they can date the, the, where how old this this dig is by the pottery. Sometimes they do it by bones. But uh, bones and pottery are the two things and so yeah. and of course l the layers of soil but it's so amazing that pottery is you know it's something that's so ancient you can find such ancient pottery yeah that it makes it kind of neat that here you are creating it and maybe you never think of this but wow someday somebody might dig up your pottery <laughs> right. Yeah. I, that is, I mean, honestly, that's a lot of responsibility as an artist to think, you know, these are, these potentially are heirloom pieces in a mm -hmm. consumer culture and mm -hmm. pottery does, I mean, clay goes through a chemical change when it's reaching 2000 degrees and hotter in the kiln, it goes through a change that really solidifies and vitrifies it into something that will last for centuries. Mm -hmm. And you're right. It's amazing to see examples of that um, from all different cultures um, that are, you know, 500 years old or older. Mm -hmm. um, and so to think that my, my work could do the same thing, my work could be passed down mm -hmm. for generations. My work could be discovered, like you said, in a dig one day. Um, that's, that's a very impactful legacy that is amazing to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's one of the fun things about going to museums is to see the, well, that's one of the things we do is go <laughs> look at the pottery that, you know, people have found throughout the ages. That's, that's really, because, you know, uh, papyrus doesn't always survive, or, you know, there are other things that not all, it doesn't survive really well, but pottery can survive. So that's really great. Right. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how familiar you are um, in this area of the United States. There was a potter who um, went by the name of Dave. Mm -hmm. And basically he was an enslaved human being who um, worked oh. for a plantation in upstate South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And he, it was amazing because not only was he a potter, um, but 
he also was educated, which is shocking for the time and for um, people and living in his condition. And so he actually would write his name on pots. There are several like Dave pots that exist and he would write poetry on the pots. Um, and so that's just an, a really amazing culture to see. Um, yeah. But even though you're oppressed in that way, that you can still um, create and create beautiful things that are lasting forever. They're in museums around this area. Oh, man, that's great. I love that story. That's great. <laughs> Well, we only, we have a few more minutes. Do you have anything else that you want to say that I have not asked you about? Oh, you've been very thorough. That's a good question. I, I do want to mention that my, I think I mentioned before my pottery has wildflowers on that. Mm -hmm. And I thought I probably should give a little bit more to my artist statement than just saying that I have flowers on my work. Um, But basically my flowers are inspired by the wildflowers I've grown up with in the Carolinas. And so I use dogwoods, thistles, wisteria, and violet in my work. And they really, to me, they're speaking to the balance between what seems to be delicate and what actually is strong. Um, Because wildflowers, they aren't planted, um, they aren't watered, they don't get their weeds pulled out of the way, they really have to grow for themselves. And, um, you know, they don't even, they're not even always seen by humanity. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's just so powerful that you can create beauty and you can be um, strong, even though you look fragile and delicate and beautiful, that there is a strength to that. And I connect so much to that because of my scoliosis experience. I don't look very strong. Um, I don't look very uh, muscular in that way. And I do have to accommodate in the studio, but there is a strength in me, um, whether that is through my writing or um, through my spiritual walk or through my pottery, there is a strength within me. I'm not delicate in every aspect of my life. Right. And so my hope is that other um, other viewers, especially women, are able to recognize their own strength within their own delicacy as well. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, the word strength, sometimes we we think that it's being forceful or that it's being uh, overbearing or whatever at the male, uh, the male view of strength, but really, um, yeah, I, I just finished reading a book about Lilith, which was so fantastic because she was trying to throughout the book uh, get the feminine and masculine back into equality And, you know, you know, the women that she met were strong in their own way. They just did things differently than the men. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. And they had a different, uh, you know, different wisdom than the men. So that was really, really interesting. A really interesting book. Yeah. I think maybe we're coming back to that now where men and women may be in the next few years or 20 or 30 years, we'll start to work together better Mm. because really we need both. Right. We need both. Yeah. (laughs) Now I do have to say that pink dogwoods are one of my favorite, although you probably like, uh, you probably have trees that are white dogwood in your area, but yeah, we do. But actually it's funny you say that. Hold on. Let me, I, uh, picked this yesterday. Oh yeah. Um, Oh, that's gorgeous. (laughs) Yeah. So there is some pink dogwood in our area, but most of it is white. Um, wisteria Mm -hmm. is my personal favorite. I, the smell is intoxicating. Oh, wisteria Wisteria is gorgeous. Yeah. (laughs) Um, in a Mexican flower that I really like is calla lily. Oh, those are beautiful. Yeah. And I just like iris too, but yeah, you got to go with what's, what's around you. And one of the wildflowers that I really like is California poppies. You probably don't have those where you live. Uh, not necessarily wildflowers. I think people will plant them, but um, Mm -hmm. poppies are beautiful. Yeah. They're not, they don't just fly in because (laughs) that's pretty far away, but yeah. Um, yeah, flowers are great. And I live in the desert and even in the desert, we have these little tiny wildflowers that are just so, so beautiful that I just, Mm. you know, when I go out to feed the birds, I'll just stop and look at these little tiny wildflowers that, 
That just are so nice. And of course the cactus also flowers right um, in the spring. So, and we've had quite a bit of rain, so maybe we will have some nice cactus flowers. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's the beauty with wildflowers. They just appear. You don't expect them. And then right. it's just such a joy to see them. Yeah. yeah. And it's kind of nice to just take the time to stop and appreciate. appreciate right. Flowers. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So uh, do you think that you will ever change your, uh, maybe your flower offerings, or at some point you'll change your pottery to, to have different motifs? Probably. Um, <laughs> I don't know what it would be right now, but yeah, I love change, especially when I have control over it in the right. way of pottery and what I'm mm -hmm. making. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that my work will continue to expand and grow. And I do, um, every once in a while, someone will ask me for a custom flower order. Oh. And so I've done some of those. Um, uh -huh. I think geraniums was my most recent one. Um, but those are a lot of fun too, to explore yeah. what the customer is interested in. Yeah. So you just wait for inspiration. Yeah. <laughs> or until I get bored with what I'm doing now. <laughs> Either way. Right. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> well, I have had so much fun talking to you and we only have a few more minutes. Do you have anything else you want to say? Oh, this has been great. I think we have covered it all, but thank you so much for having me on the show. This has um, just been a pleasure to have a conversation with you today. Oh, I know. And it's always fun to talk to another potter. I mean, <laughs> I'm not a potter, but I appreciate potters because of my husband. So it's great to mm -hmm. talk to you. And oh. I, and I hope that you sell lots of pottery and <laughs> that you're, you sell lots of books too. Well, thank you so much. So <laughs> I'll put the name of the book and we, and all of your socials in the show notes so that people can find you and can find your work. Great. That's awesome. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you like what you heard, please share it with a friend and give us a rating and or review on your favorite podcast app. It will help people find us. I invite you to join my Patreon community at patreon.com slash story power, all one word. Or if you like, you can subscribe to Story Power on Apple Podcasts. It's my aim to build a community where we discuss the stories we love and talk about what we learned from them. I offer extra audio content and story suggestions to my patrons on both platforms. Remember, as Philip Pullman said, after nourishment, shelter, and companionship, stories are the thing we need most in the world. Let's spread the story love. Until next time, this is Lucinda Sage Midgordon. Thanks for listening.